three, two, <laughs> one. Uh, welcome back, boys. This is uh, the Coast to Coast podcast, uh, episode three. How does it feel? Feeling, uh, feeling good, but feeling good to be back, but not feeling good overall. Yeah. I feel like uh, I can I can second that sentiment, Felix, for sure. <laughs> Montreal Grand Prix weekend. That's boy. it. That's it. I appreciate you boys joining. I appreciate you boys joining today based on the circumstances. Ryan, uh, just coming off a wedding uh, and and Felix just uh, a night out on the town in, in Montreal. So boys, I appreciate you boys uh, joining me under under the circumstances. Gotta uh, do what you gotta do. Man. <laughs> Happy to be here. So just to recap, last week, uh, Ryan, Landon, and I uh, kind of finished off a little bit of, uh, I guess, what we were talking about in terms of building a, building a team, building through the draft, and building a core. We talked about uh, teams like Winnipeg and Carolina, and that kind of moved into a further discussion into kind of like the, the NHL draft upcoming in, in less than three weeks in Vancouver. Um, and so that's kind of going to be, uh, you know, a precursor to what we are going to, uh, intro today, which is, you know, another draft preview. But one thing that, you know, we're really excited about is we're going to get, uh, an NHL scout on as a, as an interview next week. Uh, this guy works for an NHL organization. And so we're going to try to, you know, ask him some questions from either the fan or analyst side to kind of get some, uh, I guess some information on how, um, I guess an organization goes through, you know, an exciting process like uh, the draft. I think uh, overall, though, I think we, it's kind of hard to pass up the opportunity to talk about what's going on in sports today in terms of the NHL finals and the NBA finals. So, uh, Ryan, I think I want to toss it to you right now in terms of maybe Raptors initial feelings, initial thoughts Monday, game five. Yeah. Um, so we're recording this on uh, Sunday, June 9th. Um, the Raptors are up 3-1 on Golden State. Um, I still can't believe a, it. A, a position that they've both been on the good side and the bad side of before. Anyone who's watched basketball will know what I'm what I'm talking about. Um, I've got, you guys can't see me, but I've got the Kawhi jersey hanging right beside my bed. Um, I pray to it every night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm, I'm just, just kidding. kidding. But, but um, yeah, yeah, super, super, and super exciting to... Um, to watch, watch how, how the finals has unfolded this year, and uh, for it to be a pretty competitive series, and I know Connor, the Golden State fan, will actually probably say it's not been that competitive. Um, the Raptors have looked like the better team for they have. I'd, I'd say eighty or ninety percent of, of the quarters that that's been that have been played so far. But um, you know, KD, KD, KD is practicing today for the first time, and uh, he's actually doing some extra work with with some of the younger players after the team practice mm-hmm. too. So this, so this is the most activity he's done since straining his calf. What is it? Three weeks ago now, I want to say. Or it's almost been a month. It's almost been a yeah. month. I heard it's like today was if he didn't practice today, he wouldn't have been able to be cleared for uh, tomorrow's game. So like that, that's huge. The fact that yeah. you know, at least he's on the court. Yeah, at least there's there's that that option, and uh, you know even if he doesn't play, it, it sort of keeps the Raptors on their toes, and um, they're not able to prepare optimally because they've got to assume sort of at this point that KD is playing, just based on the news and just based on the, the impact that, that, of course, you know, I'd say KD is either the first or second best player in the league right now. So the impact that he, he could have on the series is, is immense. Um, but what we've seen so far is that, and Connor and I have, have talked about this at, at length, um, is that the Raptors are just a, a deeper team at this point. And um, this was one of the things that that Golden State. I, won't, I don't want to say sacrifice, but they more so prioritized um, bringing in KD because when you get a player of that caliber interested in joining your team, you do what you can uh, to make it happen. Um, very similar to um, John Tavares with the Leafs, you kind of just have to do what you have to do and and make that happen because uh, the potential impact of of, of, a, of a signing like that is too big and the the trickle down effect of that has been Golden State's depth. Um, yeah, you put all your eggs in one basket, right? All your eggs in one basket, and, and some of those guys are aging pretty significantly. Livingston comes to mind. Um, Iguodala can still be uh, almost, a, you know, at times he can be a star-level player in, in spots, especially defensively, but... Just um, not often the, enough anymore. Not often enough. The consistency is not there. Um, and... 
the Raptors have have just really brought a team oriented game to the table. Um, Connor brought this stat to me yesterday. The Raps have seven guys in double digits this series. Um, I think that must include guys like Van Vliet and Ibaka, yeah, uh, who are who are coming off the bench. Um, the Warriors only have three of those players, so more than double um, for the Raptors in terms of double digit scores. And we know the Raptors' defense is also elite, um, and that's been proven throughout this playoffs as well. Um, so I'm very excited to to see tomorrow. You know, the Raps have a chance to close it out in, in Game 5. Um, I'm not going to count my chickens before they hatch, but um, they're definitely in a, in a position that few other teams have, have been in. Um, obviously, as a result of, of the injury to KD and some other circumstances like uh, the Clay injury, um, where he played very well last game, but he likely wasn't 100%, um, have sort of maximized their ability to go up 3-1 on this dynasty and maybe the best team we've seen since uh, Michael Jordan's Bulls in the 90s. But um, that's sports, right? Like, uh, everyone is playing yes. hurt at this point, and uh, you can't really do anything except play who, who you're up against or play who is on your roster. So they're still the champions. They're still the defending reigning um, best team in the league and until they are taken down um, I won't I won't really be comfortable but it's been a very good finals to watch and um, yeah and another interesting thing sorry I'm gonna pass it off quickly I know I'm taking up a lot of time but uh, game four the Raptors had 17 points in the first quarter only mm -hmm. and I think that they were down by eight or six or something after that quarter, and I think Kawhi had 14 of those points. In the second quarter, Kawhi didn't score a single point, yeah. and a lot of the other guys were, were sort of able to get involved, and they kept it close. And then right as, as the second half began, when Golden State usually makes their patented third quarter run, like, like we saw in Game 2 when they went 18-0 out of the gate in the second half, um, Kawhi hit two, two huge threes, and in between that was a, was a steal... I believe in on Draymond in the low block, and he just came down in transition and, and hit the second three, and that was. I thought just, he won, uh, I thought he won the game in that sequence. Yeah, like it, I, it, just, it felt like it. You know what I mean? Like yes. he was going to take over, even though the score was I think it was tied, or maybe Golden State was still up by a couple points at that point. It, it, the momentum was was clearly um, in Toronto's favor, and Steph and Clay can only can only do so much. So. Um, yeah, really looking forward to uh, Game Five tomorrow. It's been a blast watching. Um, with, with the boys here, and we know we have we have a lot of friends in Toronto um, who are actually lifelong Raptors fans. Not unlike me, I'm more just a fan of basketball, and I like the story. But um, yeah, Connor, what uh, what have, what have you seen so far, and uh, what do you think could could happen tomorrow if KD plays or if he doesn't? Well, I think for at least the matchup in general, I think you have to give the Raptors, I guess, their, their props, honestly, like everyone, I guess I wouldn't say everyone, but most people, I guess, before the series started probably would have favored, uh, the Warriors regardless of if KD was coming back or not. Yeah. And I don't think people really realized, at least I didn't even realize either of like how deep the Raptors were and just how consistent they were able to be, um, over the course of, the last four games and like consistent together in, in the sense that uh, every game, well, you know, Kawhi is good for 30 points. You know, you have Usually. guys, you have guys like Van Fleet and you have guys like Ibaka, you have guys like Gasol, you have guys like Lowry who continuously step up, maybe not all at the same time, but there's no, there's no game where, you know, all of those guys aren't giving them something. And it's, not that for the Golden State Warriors. You have, you know, Steph who went for 47 in game three but couldn't get within seven points of the game. Well, it wasn't nearly enough, man. It's, it's crazy to think about. Exactly. And you you come back and you have Clay, uh, who was phenomenal last, or two nights ago, was efficient from the field, like, you know, had 20, 28 points on, like, 60% shooting. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. Uh, but when you don't have any other players on the team who can consistently make shots because, you know, Draymond doesn't make shots. He's not a shot maker. He's, he takes, you know, gimmies and, and I wouldn't say gimmies, but he, he'll take the right shot, but he won't make the shot. If that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense. And, you know, like you were saying earlier, Ryan, like Iguodala, 
you know, while he was an all-star, everyone said, like, oh, like, how many all-stars do they need? He's, like, 35 or something like that. Like, he's not at the peak of his uh, peak of his prowess by any means. And he's, um, you know, he's, so, he's shown, you know, spurts here and there to be uh, the defender or the player, you know, he is, but it's, but it's not consistent. Same thing goes for Sean Livingston and, you know, uh, Boogie Cousins hasn't really been himself. I mean, like, it's hard to expect him to be himself, especially coming off of two crazy injuries. But it's just it's just seeming like all of these things are coming together and it's creating, um, you know, I wouldn't say too much pressure on on Steph and Clay because obviously those two guys are, are phenomenal players, but they need some help because, you know, Kawhi is getting that help. That's, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Like, Felix, as, a, as, as someone who, I guess, maybe isn't a massive basketball fan, like, I think uh, Ryan said it, like, he's not... Um, you know, a Raptors, a diehard, lifelong Raptors fan. But as someone who doesn't really see it, but, you know, has probably felt the energy around Montreal, like it's actually been crazy how much, you know, the, how much support the Raptors have garnered here in the city. Like, what have you, what, what, have, what have you thought over this run? Um, I, I thought it's, it's great. It kind of uh, reminded me of the, uh, the atmosphere we've experienced a few years ago uh, when the Canucks were in the finals, because, you know, when has when when was the last time a Canadian team has made it to the finals? Right, it, regardless of the sport. Um, it, I think twenty eleven. I think the Jays no, got the Jays never um, made it to the, uh, to the semis. World series. That was yeah. when we were we were at Queens, yeah, but not quite all the way. Yeah, but still, like you could see, like how like the Canadians just kind of come together just to support um, the 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 Raptors. I, I think that's cool. I, it's it, you definitely see a an an uh, increase in uh, Raptors jerseys, and uh, I think everyone's just excited because it's fun. Um, I even had uh, a few friends that I didn't even know like basketball get hyped about watching the game, and um, it's actually making me wanting to dial in, maybe watch the next game. You should definitely watch tomorrow, bro, if you get a chance. Because I, I, I do think it, it's great. I think it's great for the country, and I think it's 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 great for the game too, and it's kind of the and I know like I never like really watched basketball or followed it. But I do understand the sense that of uh, expectation the Raptors had it <coughs> for the last few years. You know, like they've, you know, they've always kind of been relatively good in the main, like the regular season, but then kind of disappointed. And they did that big trade again. Like I don't, I'm kind of speaking out of my my expertise here, but I think it's good, and I and I and I and I, and I like what I see, and it's it's fun. You know, it's the end of the day. Yeah. Um. Before we move on, uh, Vib actually, our friend Vibor Mathur, shout out Vibor. Big um, shout out. Um, proposed an interesting thought, and it's something that we haven't really had to worry about. But um, a tradition in in most pro sports is that the the winner will visit uh, the White House, and if the Raptors are to win, do they visit the White House or do they visit JT in Ottawa? Like, what's the what's the play there for them? Do you guys know what I mean? I think that's awesome because that I don't think that's even been a thought for any major sport. I mean the Canucks in 2011, but of course we weren't able to get it done, so it doesn't matter. But um, yeah, that was just a, a funny thing that that was brought up yesterday, which I think is pretty cool. I guess we'd have to check. I guess what the record books say in terms of you know when when the when was the last time that a Canadian team won anything? What 93 the, with the, the, yeah the Blue Jays in in 93 the Habs the same year yeah yeah exactly so uh, yeah we can check but I I don't know it's before we were born so that's crazy it is crazy it's a long 25 years (laughs) um so yeah we'll see tomorrow um this podcast will come out after the game so uh bear that in mind uh for all our listeners I know we have a lot of devoted fans no we actually have none but we're we're trying we're trying hard and uh yeah Enjoy the game tomorrow. We'll see how it goes. So um, to then transition into the hockey, uh, the Blues and Bruins play game six, I believe, tonight? Or- yeah, game six tonight. Yep. Game six. Game six, and, you know, the Blues can close it out at home, at which could be another big, big game. Um, and um, I haven't been keeping up with the series too much because of my, my recent schedule. But it seems to be a heavy hitting series with relatively close games, except for the ex- exception of game 
three. Yeah. Um, but what do you guys think? Do you guys think the the Blues can close it out tonight and you know birth their first ever championship in the league, or what do you guys expect? Connor, you can start this one off, man. Sure. Um, I think this one's tough. Um, someone brought this up recently, and uh, I, I kind of I kind of agreed with it. it it's the sense that um, the Bruins, although they're still the Bruins. The Bruins remind me a lot of the Canucks of that 2011 series in terms of like they're, you know, gritty, but they're, you know, more reliant on their skill. Whereas the Blues, you know, a big, heavy team. Everyone keeps saying that word heavy. Everyone, I, it, it's, it's, heavy. it's great. Heavy. Um, but it's true. Like they play really tough. They make you earn every inch of space out there. And, you know, I, I would caution to say that they're maybe a little dirty, but. Um, you know, may, I, I'm not accusing a guy like Ryan O'Reilly, but there there are guys uh, on that Blues team who have maybe taken some liberties. I'm thinking like uh, that Alex Petrangelo slash like at the end of Game Three or Game Four, that empty netter. Um, that was uh, like yeah, pretty uncalled for. But anyways, I think um, I think overall, I think the Blues have a good chance and and, and should be favored to win tonight. Um, they played fantastic all series. Like I, I, other than their blip in Game Three, they've really played uh, their style of game um, throughout throughout the uh, the last couple of weeks. I think the biggest question for me is if they do win tonight, who do they who do they award the consmith to? Yeah, I was gonna. I was actually gonna bring that up as well. Um, I think o I think O'Reilly is is the logical choice. I mean, he leads them in points. Um, he had two. He scored both goals last game, I believe, even though the the controversy is real um, on on the game winner there. That that was definitely a trip. Um, another note: this year has been unusually specked with um, officiating errors, and it's sort of rare to see that in the NHL. I think, at least in my memory. Um, there's been a lot of calls that have actually gone on to, you could argue, to decide games. Like, of course, I think about um, San Jose and Vegas and uh, the hand pass a couple series later. And now um, the, the trip in, in Game 5 um, that, that sort of took the, took the air out of the Bruins building and uh, ended up being the game winner because DeBrus got one late. So that would have hypothetically tied it up and, and mm -hmm. it probably would have gone to overtime. Um, but back to the Conn Smythe stuff, I, I don't think Bennington has been... Uh, consistently sharp enough to warrant a legitimate case. I mean, his numbers aren't aren't fantastic. I, I think you could even argue Tuka Rask, in a losing effort, is more deserving um, of Bennington, despite how well uh, Jordan played in, in Game 5. I don't think he's been um, a superstar all playoffs, so my vote would be for O'Reilly, and uh, also just a really cool story that they acquired him at the beginning of the year, and they were the worst team in the NHL up until, I want to say, December, maybe even into the new year. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think we've seen a turnaround quite like that from um, from the same season, in the same season, um, for as long as I can remember. So my vote would be for O'Reilly because he has been uh, their best player and also because they acquired him and he seemed to be um, what you could argue was, was the missing piece from them being a Stanley Cup contender. So his impact has, has been felt for sure. How about you, Felix? Well, what about what the uh, overall? Con uh, Smythe. The, oh, Con Smythe. I would say O'Reilly. Uh, I think he's just been a beast, like hardest worker out there. It seems like, like that guy doesn't. It does not seem like he's got a quitting bone in his body. Yeah. Um, for the Blues, and I think that, like Ryan said, his his addition has just been enough to kind of. It seems to bring them over the edge a bit, and um, mm -hmm. and I think he. It gets everyone else stoked in the locker room, and everyone's just kind of amping up their game, seeing how hard he's delivering, like his every shift, you know. Uh, for the Blues, uh, for the Bruins, sorry, I would say if Con Smythe, I would say maybe Rask, because I think you can kind of give it to him for this this year because he's playing relatively well too, I believe, in comparison to other years where you know he's kind of disappointed in the back end for the Bruins, where they've kind of looked good, but goaltending wise, not so good. And, um, yeah, I would go with the two goalies for these guys. I don't think Bennington also, I, I agree with Ryan, I don't think he he will he will be considered 
true. that much. Okay. Maybe because okay. he's a rookie and 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 he kind of helped them to get to to get into the cups, to the cup, Stanley Cup playoffs. But I mean, I don't know. Like he's great. He's good. But I mean, like I don't, I I, I don't think it's it was that monumental. It was just a little aid. But guys like O'Reilly are who have been an addition, a recent addition to the team, who are just throwing everything out there, leaving everything on the ice type thing. Fair enough. Fair enough. So you're basically, so you're basically just agreeing with Ryan entirely, right? Well, I, I, I took, I took the O'Reilly pick. Felix said it first. Um, I just happened to agree, but yeah, we're we're on the same page. I mean, Pietrangelo was also an interesting pick too, mm-hmm. um, being the captain and uh, you know driving a lot of offense from the back end, um, while also being um, pretty physically imposing and and pretty good at at the shutdown role that he can sort of sort of be that dual threat defenseman, but. Um, yeah, he's uh, everything think, for them. He is, but I think O'Reilly is just is the story, and usually we, we, we see a story attached um, to these kinds of awards, like Ovechkin last year. I think you could have argued Kuznetsov was a better player for the Capitals in the playoffs, mm-hmm. but um, you know Ovechkin being his first cup, and he also played exceptionally well, so it was justified, but there's usually a, an element of the story as well behind it too. So Yep. No, I, I, I don't disagree with, with you guys at all. It's just kind of just... Uh, poking the bear a little bit. Um, <laughs> I was actually disagreeing with me. So. <laughs> no, I was. That's exactly what happened. Um, but I, I guess, like for me, it was, I was, I was actually looking at Petrangelo as like that second option because I do agree with you guys overall. I think Ryan O'Reilly, just based on what he does for that team um, and the way that he's kind of stepped up in in the finals as well, um, deserves to be. Deserve, deserves to be the front runner at least for for St. Louis, but a close mm-hmm. second for me would be Petrangelo, just because um, that that defense. While you know they have another big, strong, you know, har, um, hard shooting defenseman in in Pareko, you know, Alex Petrangelo doesn't really get maybe the credit he should for the way he plays because he you know is one of the better offensive defensemen in these playoffs, but he plays in every single situation, lugging more than 25, 26 minutes uh, a game in the playoffs, right? Like that averages only second to, I believe, Brent Burns. Yeah. Um, who Who is left. Um, so uh, actually, that's not true. Um, <laughs> but he's in that top 10 range in terms of uh, minutes played for uh, for defensemen in the playoffs. And, you know, he's, the, I guess technically the the, the the defenseman who plays the most um who's left so um you can, i think you can make a strong argument for him bennington i know we all have a little bit of a bias against him just because we know that the story of of uh <laughs> of, of, of bennington kind of carrying this team to the playoffs and dragging them by uh by his uh by his play is probably going to have some ramifications in terms of the calder trophy voting for um for uh, I guess with uh, with Elias Pettersson, but you know those votes are are are, are already casted. Thank God. Yeah, um, they so, are. Well, It'll be EPs for. There's no doubt about it in my mind. Bennington there has is been definitely very... a doubt because uh, <laughs> there were people who were who who did uh, vote for Benny, for Bennington and, and admitted to it. Um, I guess uh, on the record as well. Well, I mean, then I would argue that, well, I guess McDavid in his true rookie season didn't quite have the same impact as Bennington because he only played the first half of the year as opposed to the second. Um, But McDavid was the best player that season. I mean, I think he was over a point per game uh, straight out of the OHL. Um, But I don't know if Bennington just played enough games to to warrant it. And of course, Panarin was, was deserving. But um, that was sort of similar to, to Bennington is that Panarin came in as, as a, an older vet, professional veteran who had experience. And uh, I don't know. I just think Pedersen was the best rookie for the entire season. If it was just from just January to, to April, um, I think Bennington is, is a no-brainer pick. But um, Pedersen, as we know, has sort of transformed our our vision of the future and has arguably single-handedly fast-tracked our rebuild from what we thought would maybe 
you know, a five, five to six year process to, to potentially us being competitive in, uh, in two to three years if we, if we get some more pieces. So that's just how I see it. And Bennington has been great in spots this playoffs, but, um, there has been games like Landon mentioned a couple episodes where he's, where he's broken down. And, um, while every goal is, can't, isn't a goalie's fault, um, you have to be picture perfect, pristine, uh, to be a goalie and, and to win the Conn Smythe. So I just don't think he's quite fulfilled that. Um, especially with, like Connor said, O'Reilly, and like Felix said, O'Reilly and, and, and Pietrangelo uh, playing so well. I just think they deserve it a bit more. Do you guys think uh, it goes seven, or do you think it gets it, it gets one tonight? I think it's done tonight. Man, I thought Boston uh, was going to win uh, after game three. That was pretty convincing, so I, yeah. I don't know how good I am at these prediction things, but... Um, I think St. Louis should be favored, for sure. Yeah, St. Louis should be favored. NHL season is today, boys. <laughs> Calling it tonight. Perfect. We can move into our off-season stuff even uh, <laughs> even quicker. Then uh, all good. I'll say for for uh, for this game, I think it goes seven. I think the I think the Bruins have played better on the road than they have at home this That's series. True. And they also and they also played really well last game. So I think they're they're probably feeling really good about their game uh, going into tonight. And you know they have guys in that locker room who have um, staved off elimination before in the Stanley Cup Finals. Um, so I think uh, I think for the Bruins, you know they they outplayed the Blues last game, and they didn't get the result they wanted. Um, I think they're feeling really good about their game. Uh, feel good about playing in St. Louis, and they're going to steal one. And uh, Game Seven is an absolute toss-up. I have no idea, but I'm bet I would I would bet on the Bruins tonight. Cool. Yeah, I like. I think both arguments are good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stay indifferent, and uh, we'll see what happens. All right. Cool. Do you guys want to then transition to the last topic of today, which is what Connor briefly mentioned about the questions and interview with an NHL scout? Yeah, we just, we want, yeah, I, I, I don't really know what we can say. So I'm going to let Connor take the reins on this one yeah. and we can sort of jump in when, when it's right. I mean, I think we wanted this episode to just be a, a pretty quick, um, you know, just recap of, uh, today's sports or what's going on in sports, uh, um, in general today. Uh, and also just kind of preview, what we want to do next week, which is the interview with uh, this NHL scout. Um, I thought maybe what we could do is maybe pick one or two questions that we have banked um, that we're sending to him uh, and, and just talk about them amongst ourselves first. And then that way yeah. we can get his opinion on those questions uh, next week. What do you guys think? Sure. Why don't we do um, the regional sort of resource allocation that Connor and I spoke about um, and that all of us liked as well. Um, and uh, Landon had some pretty similar ones too, um, like about the NHL increasing or decreasing the, the amount of rounds. Um, like sports like basketball only have two rounds, but um, I believe football also has seven. So sort of what is the, what is the justification there? Is it simply the number of players per team? Um, how do they talk about that stuff? So I'd be down to start with um, the idea of allocating resources. Like if you're a team, um, you have X number of scouts and X number of dollars and, and capital to sort of disperse around the world. Um, how do you how do you do that? Um, is each year different? Of course it is, but sort of how how are those differences determined? Um, how does how is a draft class being strong, weak, or average determined? Um, and especially, you know, with certain teams, like I think about Florida, um, being so excellent in their finish scouting, and you can sort of see that in their, in their drafting as well. Um, that's obviously on purpose, but how does that get decided? Um, and, uh, obviously the Canucks too, with, um, the American players recently, I think we're <laughs> really building a, a good stockpile of, of, uh, USA born, born, uh, players as well. So, um, it's kind of interesting with the, the, the development team this year also having one of the strongest teams it's ever had. Um, it's kind of interesting to think about how a scouting team uh, plans and then executes on that plan 
um, based on region and how much money they're going to spend, how many resources they're going to allocate to certain certain regions. So what do you guys think about so that? So what I think I understand about NHL organizations, and this is just kind of from what I've researched and what I've heard, is that they have what's called like regional scouts. And up until recently, a lot of that um, density was kind of focused in North America, right? You would have a, a West scout, you'd have a, a U.S. scout, you'd have uh, an Ontario League scout. Um, and, you know, that wouldn't necessarily mean like they're just looking at, you know, Canadian Western Leagues. That It would be that guy who could go uh, north and south of the border. So um, kind of, I guess, covering a certain region, uh, irrespective, I, I guess, of, of the equator. But obviously, as we've all seen, um, there are lots of gains to be made at the draft table uh, when picking overseas. So, so Ryan, you mentioned Florida uh, and picking these Finnish players. Well, if you've, if you've mm-hmm. been looking at any of these, uh, of these past drafts, these Finnish players that are coming out of, uh, whether it's the SM Liga, uh, the Junior A League out in Finland, these guys are great players coming out of the, the draft. And, like, you know, Finland is, is no longer, like, this country that, you know, the pesky Finns. Like, when, when we were growing up at the World Juniors or watching at the World Championships or the Olympics, like, the Finns were always, like, in kind of, like, maybe a little bit better than the Swiss. Uh, but now they're one of the best hockey nations in, in, in the world, right? So um, it's kind of interesting to see, I would say, now that they're, they're kind of expanding out uh, into, I guess, these other regions, these European regions and... Um, and whatnot, just because of that fact, right? Whereas before, it was very much more uh, North American, North American based. Yeah, I mean, they won the World Juniors this year. So if that's not a testament to what you just said, well, they've um, won the World Juniors. I think the most since like 2010 out of any other yeah. uh, of any other uh, nation, right? So it's crazy. Country of like eight million Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hopefully, your levy can can pan out and turn into a, a great defender for us too because he led them to a very convincing gold medal win in his draft year as well. So It might have been more Patrick Line and Yesse Puyu RV, but... <laughs> potentially, potentially, potentially. Um, but yeah, no, the, the, the Finns have, have been phenomenal and uh, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll get to shine more light on it when we uh, talk, to this, uh, talk to this scout next week, which is awesome. Um, okay, well... Yeah, I think that's that that like, to me like that's such an interesting question because um traditionally it would have been, you know, more focused in North America, but it'd be cool to ask him, you know, how the change has shifted if, you know, you need someone who speaks the language to to be scouting out there. Um what it's like to develop, I guess, your scouting culture out in, you know, Europe as opposed to in in North America where you can check in with guys and update reports and just understand, I guess, that workflow a little bit better, so I think that's a really, really interesting question. To just, just based on the fact that the game is growing so much, like globally. Yeah, for sure. Did you guys um, have one more question that you sort of wanted to highlight before that you really had in mind, or uh, maybe one that's Canucks focused? I think I liked. Uh, I think that I, I liked Landon's question about, um, like, when you go draft a pl- oh, sorry, when you go draft or scout a player that either you have. Uh, stake in so if you've drafted in you know the NCAA or the USHL and you're going to watch them, um, how likely is it for you to uh, look at other players while you're you know watching say Besser play? So something that Lana was saying like oh when you when you're going to watch a guy like Brock Besser, are you also watching a guy who was drafted in the same year as you know like a uh, uh, and Adam Gaudet who played in the USHL as well that year, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's an interesting question because, you know, it, it comes down to, like you were saying, resources, right? These these scouts can only go to watch so many games. They can only go and interview so many parents and coaches and agents. I guess they don't have agents in the USHL. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's, I guess, more efficient, but it also introduces bias. And it's one of those things that, at least in the analytics sphere, um, you know, they push back a lot as well as, you know, if you only see uh, the players, you can only see so much of the players with your eye, right? So you need some, maybe some type of way to, um, I don't know, uh, sift through, I guess, the, the sands in, in the sense that uh, you want to be able to uh, pick apart the guys who may be NHL players and who may not be NHL players and go see the ones that you think have that potential. 
Um, but overall, I think you know we have drafted a lot from or the Canucks have drafted a lot from the USHL or just Americans in general, uh, and they're turning out to be pretty good picks. Like you know, Rathbone seems to had a really really good rookie season at Harvard. Yeah, he did. Uh, Tyler Madden. Tyler Madden, exactly. Lockwood, I believe, is going back for his fourth year um, at Michigan. He's captain. Yeah, I think. but I think you know he's he's made it clear he wants to sign with with the team. So if anyone has any concerns about the four year you know senior thing where he could he could walk. Well, usually that that works for guys who are, uh, you know, high profile, prolific scorers. I wouldn't I wouldn't loop Lockwood into that into that group. So I think he would uh, want to sign with 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 Vancouver. And like you said, Ryan Tyler Madden, like he had a fantastic rookie season. So it's it's one of those things where maybe you know going to this pool is is a good idea. Yeah, and I, I think what you mentioned before about having ways to. Um, sort of streamline the process because there's so much more to just scouting than than just watching players. Um, you know, I, I believe Madden's at the same school that Godet went to as well at Northeastern. Yep. Um, so maybe if if there's a familiarity with uh, the training staff there, the coaching staff there, um, maybe that sort of gives you a, a better idea of how that player is going to develop. So there's definitely an element of uh, familiarity and uh, consistency that you get when when you're pulling from. Uh, the same region, the same leagues, and as teams develop relationships with the uh, the coaches and the people who are involved in developing the players at, at the junior and, and college level, um, I definitely think that that gives an extra element of certainty um, to at least the training and, and the types of games and the types of, of matchups that those players are going to experience. So I really like that point too. Yeah, and I think for in terms of uh, trying to guide where you're going to... Um, I guess, look, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, most people will trust their eyes. I, I would say that, you know, everyone on this, uh, on this podcast would, would say that too. Like you would have to read or see something to believe it, right? So um, same thing goes for prospects. Like as, as much as, you know, we want to draft the most efficiently as possible, if uh, you look at your draft uh, model, like the, the paper one that um, I, I, I had made, I don't want to follow that to a T if, if it means that I'm going to make, you know, picks of players that I don't te- technically believe in, right? So um, it'd be cool to understand, at least at, on the NHL side, where their starting point is. And if it is, Ryan, like like you said, is it the familiarity with even some organizations, you know, like, like, like the London Knights? Like everyone seems to be drafting and picking good players on average coming out of that organization. So maybe... Um, that does play into it as, as a good starting point because you know uh, they're like the Patriots of junior hockey, right? Like every every yeah. time they come in and they, they pick a good player, they, they, they develop them, they put them in their system, teach them the right way to play because they, they know that they have a long history of making NHL players. It, it definitely, it definitely uh, adds to like this, this pedigree notion of uh, producing good players. And whether that bias is, is right or not, um, at least on the statistical side, there hasn't really been any research on it, but um, I would say that it, it does impact, at least on, on the anecdotal side. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more, and uh, yeah, I'm super excited to get some answers from someone who's actually in, in those war rooms, right? Because the most uh, NHL drafting experience I have is uh, GM mode in, in the NHL video game, so it'd be nice to get some real analysis from... Uh, Someone who actually knows what they're talking about, for sure. So you're saying that it's not as easy as picking McFarland first overall and having him be a, a, a franchise center <laughs> in all of our GMs, no? Ones, no? N- not quite. Not quite that, that simple. Yeah, I think there's a little more to it. Awesome. Just a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Felix, any notes from, from you, my man? Or uh, should we just wrap this one up and, and get, get pumped for next week? Oh, we may have lost Felix. Did we lose Felix? I think he went to sleep, which is totally fair. <laughs> was that fire? Was that fire? Uh, fire truck? You or, or him? It sounded like me. I'm 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 right by VGH, as you know. Right. So, um, so many uh, ambulances and and stuff going by. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I I can wrap it up here. Yeah, hopefully it wasn't Felix needing an ambulance. I kind of just understood what you meant. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I can kind of wrap it up here. Um, so this is a shorter episode than normal, um, sort of just as a preview for, for a really exciting interview next week with, 
um, an NHL scout who were, were super happy and super lucky to, uh, to, to have gotten a hold of and uh, who's agreed to come on this, this little podcast of ours. So that's going to be awesome. Emphasis on the little um, for sure. <laughs> emphasis on the little. And uh, absolutely pumped about uh, the NBA and the NHL finals. We've got uh, game six tonight of the Stanley Cup. Will Boston force a seventh game, or will St. Louis make their fans sing Oh Gloria yet again for the last time this year? Um, and will KD play tomorrow and uh, put another wrinkle in what's been a very interesting NBA final so far? So that's um, that's the third full episode of, of Coast to Coast. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, and I'll throw it to Connor for any uh, other closing comments before we sign off here. I mean, I really think, Ryan, from now on, you should just open and close because it's either it's either <laughs> you're like almost like radio sounding voice or just like your very like meticulous way of kind of weaving through topics and ideas. I, I, um, I think we're, we're going to we're going to assign those 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 responsibilities to you from now on. Thanks, brother. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Um, we can obviously change it up if we want to, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we can definitely go with that moving forward. But, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Enjoy, enjoy the sports while we can, yes. because very soon there won't be, there won't be much. Um, and once that happens, you can expect some, some awesome off season basketball and hockey content, uh, from coast to coast moving forward as well. Most so, definitely. Uh, thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. If you guys have and, any uh, uh, questions you want to submit for us. Uh, to ask, um, I, mean, I guess we can we can say who it is now. Chris McDonald of the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, let us know whether you're reaching out via you know the Facebook uh, page or on Twitter or any of the mediums you can you can reach us at. If you guys have any questions that you want us to ask uh, to ask him, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Sorry. Yeah. Me so Canucks off. fans, no worries at all. Great, great closer. NHL fans, Canucks fans, um, let us know. What you want to hear from the NHL scout we'll be speaking to. Um, you can follow us on social media, on Instagram. All the links will be uh, in the description here. And uh, let's just chat. Like, we're just fans at the end of the day. So we want to hear from, from everyone as well. So let us know what you guys think. And, uh, yeah, keep, keep an eye out for our next episode coming next week. Awesome. Rye, it's been a pleasure. As always. Take care of yourself, all right? You too, brother. Talk, Talk to, you to you soon. soon. Peace. Later. Bye, Felix. Bye, Felix. Okay, we'll have uh, we'll have Clute play us out again. Just like Perfect. we'll, we'll splice. I it. like our. I, it was good, right? I liked our intro. I liked our intro as well too. I think it worked well as an outro, Chris's, and then our our little rap beat for the intro.